Hello, welcome to episode nine of how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams. Today's episode is based on chapter five of the book, and it's called Music Publishing Isn't Scary or Confusing. Um, well, the full chapter title in the book is plus how to land a sync placement, but that's going to be next week's episode, the sync placement stuff with uh, Lauren Ross. First, what is music publishing? There are two rights in music. There's the master recording side, and then there's the songwriting side. So music publishing, so let me back up. I swear it's easy, I promise. <laughs> Everyone knows what a record company is supposed to do in theory. Um, I assume everyone does. I feel like I could stop someone on the street and they would, for the most part, understand what a record company does. So a record company's job is to promote and legally exploit, as in collect as much money as possible for the master recording. That's their job. Collect as much money as possible on the recording and uh, promote it so it gets as much money as possible. All music publishing is, is the exact same thing for your songwriting. So there's no reason to run to the hills in terror, you know, being completely overwhelmed and intimidated by music publishing. And I think that happens for two reasons. One, there are a variety of revenue streams that make up music publishing, but I just want to teach you what it is and how you collect on it. If you want to go read a book about music publishing and learn about, well, I should define a mechanical royalty, but learn about all of the sub revenue streams that make up music publishing, feel free to do that. Keep that book on the shelf. But I like the vast majority of songwriters slash artists that I meet don't know and industry people. There are tons of industry people. Um, you know, I'm jumping around, but I remember being in a meeting with someone who was 20 years older than me and had been working in the industry his entire adult life who said, oh, I never understood all that music publishing stuff. And that just super confused me because it's like, if you're going to enter a field, in this case, the music industry, don't you want to um, know everything about it? But like I said, so there's all these sub revenue streams. I don't think you need to know that. You need to know what music publishing is, which is what I just defined and how to collect on it, which I'll talk about next. So again, that and then the collecting on it, that's also the scary part from the 50s, 60s and 70s, because to collect on it, you had to sign your music publishing rights away to collect on it. So there's a lot of horror stories, but it's not like that anymore. I mean, you can still do those deals, which I'll talk about, but um, you can own your rights and collect on your music publishing, which is very exciting. I write a song or you write a song or an album or an EP or an opera or whatever. And the first thing you want to do, which is what we covered in the previous episode, is you want to make sure that you are signed up for a performing rights organization. Um, in the U.S., that's primarily ASCAP and BMI. So pick one, register yourself, sign up only once. But every time you write a song and you agree to the songwriting splits and you put it in writing and you sign it or you email it to each other, as, we, as we've talked about, then you log in to your PRO, so ASCAP or BMI in, in the US, and you register the songs. So that's the first thing you do. And I don't know if we covered that part clearly enough in the previous episode. Every time you write a song, you know, if you're a solo songwriter, just uh, register it with your PRO. If it's a co-write, obviously agree to the splits and then you both need to register it. So that's the first step. And like I said in the previous episode and said throughout the podcast, I totally understand, you know, when you sign up for a PRO, uh, you are not collecting on your publishing in full. And that is understandably totally confusing because when you sign up for a PRO, that is also split into two sides. Uh, the writer's share and the quote publisher's share. And so when it when ASCAP, for example, prompts me to create what's called a publishing designee, they're like, oh, you're Emily White, the songwriter. Great. So that's your writer's share. Do you want to be Emily White music um, for your publisher's share? Of course, that's totally confusing. It's like, oh, that's my publisher's share. So my publishing is all set. So ASCAP is not ASCAP and BMI and performing rights organizations are not music publishers. They just collect performing rights royalties. So if your music is being 
covered, streamed, sold, any, all of the above, and you are just signed up for a PRO, you are missing money. And that is what this chapter and episode is about. I have worked with way too many songwriters and artists um, that people have heard of that have national, international careers that were not collecting on their music publishing. So if you, if um, again, if you are just signed up for your performing rights organization uh, as a songwriter and you are not collecting on your publishing in any other way, you are most likely uh, missing money. I'm so thrilled to welcome my guest, Song Trust President Molly Newman. Welcome, Molly. Hi, Emily. Thanks for having me. We are offering access to a part of the industry that has been historically very un inaccessible, inaccessible, right? Like it's it's just like global publishing administration and collections from, you know, and direct collections from societies with through our direct affiliation network and the digital um, licensing schemes that we participate in are not something that like the independent songwriter or even an independent publisher has had a very sort of easy way to tap into. You know, historically, sub-publishing networks for small publishing companies or even medium-sized pub publishing companies are a pretty traditional scheme and that, you know, those can be very successful if you have activity in that market that they can help you activate and, you know, make sure that you have all of the licensing opportunities that are relevant to that local market. But those aren't really as um, available to your average independent writer or producer, beat maker, whoever, now that's an increasingly important segment of the, the creative community. Um, and so what we, you know, how I think about, um, you know, the sort of the access that, you know, the Kickstarter model is sort of like access to resources through your community. We have a sort of, you know, complementary zone of access to this, you know, infinite fractions of rights that you have to manage that you might represent and that you have to collect on. And we're trying to do it in a, you know, responsible, um, flexible and, you know, fair way. Music publishing is the number one revenue stream I see missing with artists and songwriters. And I think that's because um, when they sign up for their PRO, which almost all of them do, you know, the PROs are old enough and um, established enough that, you know, people are like, okay, yeah, like sign up, you know, they sign up for ASCAP when they're a teenager or BMI or whatever. Um, but I think the point of confusion, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, is when they're prompted to sign up for a publishing designee. Um, what, once they do that, what, you know, when I meet songwriters and artists of all levels and I ask them their publishing situation, they're like, oh, I'm with ASCAP. Oh, I'm with BMI. Mm -hmm. And then I find mm -hmm. out they are not collecting on their music publishing. Are you seeing this? Because you're obviously talking to way more songwriters than I am every day. Yeah, I mean, our team, yeah, that's a lot of the, you know, like the first question, I think if you can go to our help center, like, you know, do I need song trust if I have ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, IMRO, PRS, any of the, you know, hundreds of, of societies around the world? And, you know, there's a, there's lots of interpretations of how to, to manage those rights and those royalties that you are due. Um, you know, so we, there, and, and the way that they're, they are structured based on, you know, our industry sort of systems is that there's a publisher share, there's a writer share, um, part of the publisher share does require you to have either an entity or as you say, and in, in, you know, some of the PROs, like a designation that is like kind of comes up, adds up to 200% or whatever it is that, you know, that whichever one you're looking at, cause they do sort of administer them differently. Um, there's also other, um, there are other royalties that are earned by your works based on all of the new emerging platforms and systems too. And there's also, then you add in multiple countries and if you, learn more and dig into it more about the reciprocal arrangements between societies for the specific rights that they are able to collect on you learn that management of that on your on a sort of one entity to one person um without a traditional publishing infrastructure or what we think of as a modern publishing infrastructure um is is really hard 
And, you know, I think it's arguable that with independent writers, like where, if their earnings are primarily in their home country or their home territory, you know, it's probably more of an exception that you're earning tremendous sums globally, but it's still your money. And there's that other piece of, you know, the, the system where unclaimed works and unclaimed royalties then unfortunately become sort of redistributed at certain stages based on local, you know, requirements and rules. And, you know, so we also see ourselves as part of like a source of, of, you know, a great deal of, of rights that we represent, a chance for that to be minimized. So the, the money to be distributed to its rightful rights owner. And, you know, that's a really important part of what we do as well. Agreed. We're just trying to make your lives easier, people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we're here for you.